Detective Riley can be seated. <coughs> Thank we you. We can bring the jury in. Jurors are not ready to come in. They're, on the, they're coming out of the uh, jury assembly room. So we will just take a brief recess.
picture 25. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, just briefly, with respect to this photograph, uh, there is a arrow at the bottom right of the or photograph. Do you see that? Yes. What is that arrow supposed to do? To that arrow uh, uh, basically designates up, or it orient, helps orient the print. Okay. And last photograph on that file, uh, 14, picture 26. Uh, that is a, uh, another latent print uh, lifted from the Suburban. With respect to the, uh, oh, was this also designated a number, an exhibit number? Yes, this was uh, latent print number 13, uh, State Police Exhibit 116. Okay. With respect to the Chevy Suburban, um, was there another day that it was examined or processed? <coughs> uh, Yes, in June. Okay, so in, in the June processing, uh, what did that entail? That, entail, that entailed uh, uh, examining the undercarriage of the vehicle. Okay. And was there a third time that that vehicle was processed? Yes, that was uh, sometime in September, I believe. Okay. Um, in the, in uh, a few uh, months later? 2019, 2019. correct. 2019, thank you. Where was the vehicle located when it was processed? It was located in the uh, impound lot at uh, Troop L. Litchfield. And what was the purpose of that examination? That was to uh, obtain uh, more swabs from the interior of the vehicle, more swab samples. And were any swabs taken? Yes. So what were those swabbings? I seized swabs from uh, uh, the steering wheel, uh, gear shift, believe uh, uh, seat adjustment controls, things like that. And do you recall what uh, exhibit number those were? Uh, not off the top of my head, ma'am. Okay. I may just have one moment. <coughs> Don't have the box up here. Never mind. I may just have one moment, Your Honor. I'll withdraw that, Your Honor. I don't have my file for that one. May I just have a moment? Yes. I don't want So with respect to the other vehicle that was inside the garage, the Range Rover, I'm going to draw your attention specifically to States 9, file 15. Okay, if you can, take a look behind you, sir. What does that vehicle depict, please? Or, I'm sorry, what does that picture depict? That's the, uh, the front of the Range Rover that was parked in the garage at 69 Wells. Picture two, and what does that show? That is the uh, driver's side <laughs> of the Range Rover. And I'm gonna draw your attention actually down to and scroll in to the here where there's a pink sticky and a marking. It's a little blurry, but can you see what that depicts, sir? Um. I can't see, ma'am, but it's marked up uh, in a similar manner uh, of a swab being taken. Do you recall what swabbing that was? Uh, can I take a closer look at the screen? Yes, and would it also refresh your recollection and take a look at your report? That would be better. If I may just approach the clerk, Your Honor. Yes. for a 
Did that refresh your recollection, sir? Yes. Uh, if you could, if you wouldn't mind, uh, what, if you wouldn't mind getting up and pointing to the screen again, I apologize. And could you please identify, if you could, to your knowledge and recollection, what uh, markings those are? Yes, that is um, Exhibit 61 is on the uh, front door. And 62 is on the rear door. And with respect to those exhibits, um, did you swab them? Yes, they were uh, um, field tested, swabbed and collected in the same manner as the other stains in the garage. And was that two swabs? Uh, two swabs for the evidentiary uh, collection. And CAM result? Uh, CAM uh, was positive. Okay. Uh, state picture three, what is that, sir? Uh, that is another uh, blood-like stain uh, found on the Range Rover. As far as location, I would have to refer to my report. If you could, sir, please. And do you know the location of that uh, photograph or what's depicted in that photograph? Yes, that is a blood-like stain uh, we found on the left side of the hood. Okay. And was that swabbed? Yes, it was uh, field tested, uh, swabbed and collected. And the results of the field test? Uh, field test was positive. <clears throat> Sir, uh, picture four out of file uh, 15, I believe. What does that picture depict, sir? So that's the uh, um, Exhibit 61 I spoke about uh, before on the uh, front door of the, excuse me, left front door of the Range Rover. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the apparent spatter pattern that the stain was uh, collected out of. And same questions with respect to the the seizing of it as a green exhibit, please. Yeah, so that was uh, that, uh, field tested, it was field tested positive, and then it was collected in the usual manner. And that's uh, two swabbings? Uh, two swabbings, correct. Thank you. Picture five. Uh, that's a blood like stain found on the left rear door of the Range Rover. Um, and that was uh, field tested, uh, it was KM positive, and it was collected with two swabs, uh, similar to all the others. And when you say rear door, which side of the vehicle? Uh, that was uh, driver's side, left side. Picture six. Picture six is the left front corner uh, of the bumper of the Range Rover. Um, State Police Exhibit 60 was a swabbing, um, or two swabbings, collected from that stain that the arrow was pointing to. And exhibit 69 is a sample of the blood-like stain um, that was found below it. Uh, <coughs> both items were field tested, they field tested positive, and both were collected in the usual manner, two swabs. <coughs> Picture seven. Uh, that is a photo of exhibit, State Police Exhibit 63, uh, the location of which escapes me, ma'am. If, if you could refer, refer to, to your exhibit report, please. The term <coughs> for the record is states 11 Friday. Thank you. 
Okay, that stain is on the left rear fender of the Range Rover. Um, it was also field tested uh, positive with the KM test and was collected with two swabs in the usual manner. Picture eight. Uh, okay, so eight is a latent print taken from the Range Rover. Um, latent print number nine, exhibit 93. Um, if I could double check the location. If you could refer to your report, please. And latent print number nine was lifted from the uh, front fender. And uh, just with respect to the latent print number nine, can you just walk us through the process of taking the print off of the vehicle? So this print, um, again, once it was developed um, and marked, photographed, we would take uh, uh, adhesive acetate, something clear. Uh, probably in this case, uh, I used a gelatin lifter. Again, uh, it's a thin layer of gelatin on top of a rubber backing. Uh, it kind of molds better to the, the curves of the, uh, the car. Picture nine. That is a, a photo of exhibit 58, which was a sampling of the blood like stains found on the grill. And if you could just uh, head up to the screen, I have a few questions with this. Now, with respect to Exhibit 58, uh, what are you, what did you designate 58 as? It was these uh, blood-like stains here. And did you do any testing or anything on those stains? Uh, I field tested these with the KM test, um, which was a positive test. Okay. Actually, if you could, what about up here, one above, I'll start with the one above the V. I believe those scales were placed there to document the uh, the apparent uh, spatter found up here, uh, probably placed there by the photographers. Did you take any uh, samples or swabbings, I should say, for anything above the, the rover, the no, words rover? because they're not marked as an exhibit. Okay. Picture 10. Sir, so with respect to the, um, right above the, I guess the measurement marking or the, the label, the exhibit 58, um, was that the area that was swabbed or that you're designated as exhibit 58 or is it, my other question is, is it above the grill? Is it separated or did you include that as the entire, um, any of the blood spatter? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can I refer to my exhibit report? If you can. Okay, I was mistaken. Uh, this wasn't a blood swab. Uh, we were treating this uh, this apparent uh, impression or a print and blood-like material that we found on the grill. Uh, we photographed this in the usual manner, um, in a manner similar to uh, the, uh, the way we did the prints on the floor. So uh, these were photographed, and then later the photographs were designated as Exhibit 58. So just to be clear, there was not swabbed in this? I did not swab this. Okay, uh, and it was not tested or it was tested? Uh, I believe... Um, Objection. I'm just asking well, to clarify, Your Honor. The question is, was this swabbed or was it not swabbed? And the response was going to be, I believe. Well, there can be a follow-up question. Court will overrule the objection. I can't say for sure. Either. And with respect to any uh, any 
testing on it, do you recall if there was any testing on Exhibit 58? Uh, nothing beyond photography. <coughs> so we on to photograph 11. What does this depict? Uh, that is more bullet like stains on the grill of the uh, Range Rover. And picture 12. Uh, that is uh, another photo of the blood like stains on the left rear door of the Range Rover. And what about this marking from, I guess, in the middle and of so, the exhibit? And so, um, along the side of the car, you can see in this road grime here, uh, you know, salt, dirt, sand, uh, you can kind of see it like a swipe mark through there. Picture 13. A uh, photo of uh, some blood like stains on the, this is the left front wheel of the Range Rover. Now, with respect to the Range Rover, was there also a uh, additional processing? Yes, we process this in, a, in our uh, usual manner of uh, processing the vehicle. And I'm going to show you what's been marked. Before we proceed, Attorney Manning, it may be more advantageous for the record if there was a better description of wheel. Oh. Is it tire? Is it rim? That's true. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, if you could just describe um, what you see in the photograph, please. Of uh, This is States 13. Uh, sure. Uh, when I refer to the wheel, it's really the rim, uh, not, not the rubber tire. So I'm looking at these, um, I'm referring to these blood-like stains inside uh, the metal of the rim. And for the record, you're pointing to where on the photograph? Um, basically throughout the, in the uh, approximate center of the photo. And picture 14, sir, do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? That's the Range Rover. Uh, we examined this along with the uh, Chevy Suburban at Troop G in Bridgeport uh, on June the 26th, 2019, uh, for similar material, additional biological material from the undercarriage. Picture 15. What does that picture depict? This is an overall uh, view of the undercarriage uh, seen while the vehicle was up on a lift. You can see um, on this L-shaped scale here, the photographer added a directional arrow for front. So the front would be the top of the screen. And then uh, driver's side or left side of the vehicle is toward the right side of the screen. Picture 16. Uh, this was um, seized from the lower area um, of the Range Rover. Uh, as item D. Again, this was scraped into a uh, paper fold, uh, designated as item D, and later the area was uh, swapped. And item E. Uh, I'm sorry. Picture 17. <clears throat> With respect to item E on picture 17. Yes, this is, is on that? the left side of the Range Rover. Again, uh, kind of around the rocker panel. So uh, item E is designated by the arrow. This uh, material was scraped into a paper fold and later the, uh, the area was swabbed. And picture 18, please. Again, just a, another photo of uh, item E. Thank you, sir. You can sit down. I want to go back and ask you a few more questions about that October um, October processing for, of the Chevy Suburban. Um, do you recall how many exhibits you took, if any, out of the car that day? Uh, not off the top of my head, ma'am. If I can. Would it refresh your recollection if you look at your report? Yes. I 
may approach the clerk, Your Honor. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Did that refresh your recollection, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, with respect to that processing, how many swabs were taken out of the car that day? Uh, there were six exhibits okay. uh, containing anywhere between two and four swabs. And what were some of the, if I, for instance, um, do you recall exhibit 370? Yes. So what was that swabbing of? That was a swabbing of the uh, steering wheel. Um, and that <coughs> um, was complete with uh, four swabs. And are you utilizing a report to refresh your recollection on this? Yes. Okay. Exhibit 371? Uh, 371, again, uh, four swabbings from the steering wheel. Uh, these were from the um, areas with visible blood stains. Uh, the item before that 370 was taken from unstained areas or apparent unstained areas. Attorney Manning, the court heard that there was a third processing in September 2019 and council made reference to a processing in October. If I may uh, inquire of Detective Riley, Your Honor, is there another processing in September? Uh, no, the processing, this, the processing where we took the extra swabs was actually, the proper date was October 18th. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. And, uh, with respect to exhibit, how about exhibit 372? 372 was uh, four swabs taken from the interior side of the left front door. Do you recall where the, that was on the door? Um, it was, uh, I ran the swabs around all areas of the door in an effort to pick up as much uh, genetic material as I could. And exhibit 373? Uh, that was taken from the, uh, the left front seat adjustments, uh, this was two swabs. And by front seat adjustments, just what do you mean by that? So there are the uh, side buttons on, uh, on the driver's seat used to adjust, uh, adjust the seat for the driver. And 374? Uh, 374 was uh, swabs taken from uh, the rear view mirror. And 375? And 375. Um, was swabs taken from the rear seat controls in the cargo area. If I may have one moment, Your Honor. Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you. Cross examination, Attorney Shaw. Good afternoon, Mr. Riley. You're retired, right? Yes. I hope you're enjoying your retirement. I am, thank you. Let me ask you a few questions. Let's start with these, this presumptive testing that you know, we've talked a lot about here. Um, it's my understanding, as, as you testified, that when we're talking about these chemical presumptive tests, there are at least two that you talked about today, right? Yes. The first was called Castle Meyer begins with a K instead of a C, right? It's like hyphenated two names. Yes. And the second one was something called luminal, right? Yes. And Castle Meyer, you said, is made up of uh, two chemicals. One is phenylphthalein, right? Yes. And the other is hydrogen peroxide, right? Yes. Now, phenylphthalein is the stuff that they use to test swimming pools for chlorine, right? Isn't that the same stuff? I don't know, sir. So you're not an expert in, in science, you're not a chemist or anything like that, right? No. 
So when you said you had some training in it, you were trained in how to administer it, right? Yes. You don't know anything about the chemistry itself and why something uh, shows pain or flows or changes color at all, right? That's correct. And the training you said you also received from the lab some kind of like a kit in order to administer it, right? Yes. And phenolphthalein is a um, liquid, isn't it? Yes. And, and so is uh, hydrogen uh, peroxide, correct? Yes. Now, hydrogen peroxide, that's the same chemical that you use maybe if you have an infection, maybe, to disinfect, right? Yes. And I guess some people might even use it to uh, bleach their hair, right? In the, in the day, right? Isn't there people have peroxide hair where they really white bleach blonde? Is that the same stuff? I'm, I'm not sure, sir. Okay. But in any event, you also said that there are things, when you talk about presumptions, right, you're, you're trying to see if there's a place that you're going to do some swabbing or photography, right? For uh, the Castlemire, yeah. it's more, um, we do our searches visually. Okay, so you see something that looks like a stain, right? You maybe uh, do a little uh, chemical wipe with the KM, right? Or collect or conduct a KM test, correct? You do a KM test, and if it comes back <laughs> negative, do you still take a picture of it? Uh, sometimes. So we saw a couple of those. You tested a stain on the floor of the garage, and it didn't even come up with a presumptive test, right? Right. But in any event, if it comes up presumptive, one of the things you indicated that it's presumptive for is blood, right? Uh, well, the test, it's presumptive for blood. That's what I mean. The right. test is presumptive for, for um, blood by putting the two chemicals together with the sample, right? Yes. And you did mention a couple of things that it also is presumptive for, right? Uh, yes. Animal blood is one? Yes. And of course, there's all sorts of animals, right? Yes. It doesn't distinguish between one animal or another, does it? No. I think you also mentioned horseradish is something that it uh, tests positive for? That's, that's one of the classical examples. Okay. Now, there, are you familiar with some of the other things that it tests positive for? Uh, I'm familiar with turmeric. Turmeric, right? right? Now, right. doesn't it also test positive for tomato? Uh, I don't know. What about rust, iron rust? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? No. How about bleach? Do you know about that? No. How about copper? No. You don't know? Is that what you're saying? Whether it tests, whether it'll show a presumptive positive for um, copper, uh, like iodized copper. I don't think so, sir. How about malt, like you find in either beer or a milkshake? Uh, that I don't know either. Aren't there, in fact, sixteen different food groups that test positive using Castlemire? Uh, I I don't know, sir. We'd have to have somebody who's like a scientist that knows this to really answer those questions, right? Yes. But um, if we're talking about a presumptive test, if you wanted to be presumptive about the presence of horseradish, this would be the test to use, right? Um, I would need to presume something was horseradish, sir. Well, the presumptive test is not what you think, it's whether it turns pink, right? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm following your question, sir. I mean, it does react in a positive manner with horseradish. So I'm saying if I wanted to presume that a stain on my kitchen cabinet was horseradish, I might use this test, right? If you really wanted to. Exactly. And so let's say a, um, I don't know, spilled hamburger, piece of hamburger juice. That would test positive, right? I don't know. I've never tried it on hamburger, sir. Well, hamburger is basically animal meat, right? Yeah, but I've never tried it on hamburgers. Fair enough. But it would also test positive for, I don't know, a cat, a little blood of a cat, right? Oh, yes, animals, absolutely. Mice, right, is a garage, right? If, if you had an injured mouse, yes. But 
you would also agree, would you not, that you would need a confirmatory test done by a lab to see whether the presumption or assumption turned out to be correct, right? Yes. And you know that in your, never mind this case, but in your experience, some of the things that you show a positive presumptive test turn out not to be uh, blood at all, correct? Uh, I've never had that experience. Well, you don't do the actual testing, do you? No, I mean, when I learn of the results, I've never had that experience. So you don't know that in this case, that was in fact, several of these items turned out not to have any uh, evidence of blood in it? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. You didn't even test all of the spots that we just saw pictures of, did you? Me personally? No, yeah. I didn't. Let me ask you a few questions about luminol. We saw some pictures in the back of the uh, of the suburban, right? Including a couple in the dark where you see this little purple glow, right? Blue glow, correct, sir. Blue, purple. Um, those were kind of like, with those with photographs were taken with a uh, time-lapse photography, right? Uh, yes. So they appeared brighter than they might with the naked eye, correct? Uh... I can't say for sure, sir. And you use that in order just to choose where you might take another swap, right? Yes. Now, you said that um, luminol tests for the presence of iron, right? Yes. So you know that a car is made out of steel, or most of them are, right? Yes, it is. And steel is an iron alloy, is it not? It is. So it would stand to reason that in a uh, motor vehicle, there might be some exposed metal places that might test positive using luminol, right? Oh, correct. So if you wanted to um, see if your car was rusty, <coughs> you might spray some luminol on it, and you would have a positive glowing result, right? Uh, it, it would even glow on the non-rusted parts. Right, but you're, it would glow on even the non-rusted parts because right. you're in a car, right? Uh, yes. And if you're talking about, let's say, a car where there are children that have been passengers in that car, there might be all sorts of other things that will test positive for the presence of iron. Isn't that true? Uh, possibly, yes. You know that um, I think turnips also test positive for luminol, don't they? I don't know that for a fact. You know, a lot of root vegetables have iron in them, right? No. You do know that, I right? do know. And it's, it's actually they're good for you to eat, right? right. Am I right? I'm going to object, Your Honor. Well, the question's not relevant, sustained. If you wanted to see if you'd maybe dropped a turnip on the ground in the back seat of the car, you might lose use luminol and it might glow, right? Objection. Ground. Irrelevance, and I assume it's facts, not in evidence. Well, the line of the cross-examination is a number of substances or fruit or vegetable contain iron. This is just an extension of that line overruled. All right. I think you'd be able to see a turnip and would need luminol. But the luminol might illuminate it, right? Um, I don't know. I've never tried it on never a turnip, sir. Fair enough. Bleach also <laughs> will glow in luminol, won't it? Yes. You already mentioned horseradish for K and M. This would also test positive in luminol, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't know for sure. How about rust? Uh, yes. So if a, a child had, let's say, ice skates in the back of the car, some of that maybe scratched off on the back seat. Objection. That would test positive for luminol, wouldn't it? Well, here's an objection. And it calls for a hypothetical, but the hypothetical isn't developed in such a way as to aid the jury. Essentially what the question is, is since there are ice skates, ice skates have metal, probably steel, steel is an alloy of iron. In other words, it's an extension, but the extension is becoming very thin. So the court is going to allow the question. And I will then move on, but if you want to just answer that question, I'm not going to go into a million hypotheticals. Yes, it's possible. All right. 
A lot of these photographs that we've seen were various angles of the very same spots that you tested, isn't that right? Uh, yes. So just by looking at these photographs, you'd have to look very carefully to see whether or not uh, three, four, or maybe even five photographs were of the same location that you did a swipe, swap, isn't that right? No, I just swabbed from the areas that were marked as exhibits. Oh, no, no, I understand right. that. I'm talking about <laughs> photographs of different angles to a certain extent of the same areas that you had swabbed. Yes. I also want to be clear about the, uh, the measuring tapes that are in many of these pictures. The white tape is in centimeters and millimeters, correct? And I believe it's inches on one side, too. Well, in the yellow, isn't the yellow uh, the inches? Uh, you, you said the white tape, sir? Yeah, doesn't the white tape, tape say metric on some of them in those pictures? Uh, I don't know. I would have to look at the pictures. All right, fair enough. But if, if you're familiar with the fact that there's a distinction between the metric system, which uses centimeters and millimeters, and the American measuring system that uses inches and feet, right? Yes. I want to ask you a few questions about the um, paper towels in the kitchen. And the first thing I want to do is call up one of the pictures that um, was on the exhibit that was introduced through you. And if I could have 8-139 for your edification, this is the image where you put the, the state police uh, exhibit number 13 on. If you would look at that screen behind you, sir. You see that image there? Yes. And I think you testified that this was the paper towel that you examined. You did a, a some kind of a, a, a test on it as well, right? Yes. And you seized the whole thing or just a portion of it? Uh, the whole thing, sir. When you came into the house that day, this would be the 25th, correct? Uh, yes. Was this exactly when you went in the location where you found this paper towel roll? Uh, not the exact location, no. It was moved around? Uh, it was in that general s same corner of the sink, sir. Did you move it so that somebody could take a better picture? No, I moved it so I could examine it and field test it. When, you, when this picture was taken and you put that yellow tab next to it, is that the location you found it in before you moved it and examined it? Uh, no, I don't believe so, sir. Not to Where was it when you first observed it, if you can just point it out on this uh, photograph? I would just uh, remember in that general corner of the sink, sir. So when you say in the corner of the sink, was it off the uh, roller? That is the, um, the, the metal device that the paper towel roll is uh, standing next to? I believe so, but I'm not sure, sir. Did you observe anyone else move it? Uh, no. And just so that we're talking about the same thing, right? Um, I'm referring to this item here that's to the left of the paper towel roll. You see that there? Yes. Sir. You recall seeing that there, right? Yes. But when you got there, that paper towel roll was not on that device, the, the dispenser roll. Uh, I, I think they were separate, but I'm not sure. Well, if, if you're not sure, do you not recall seeing someone physically remove it? Objection. Well, the response was he's not sure if it was on the holder. And the question is, was, well, if you are not sure, can you recall someone seeing, or can you recall seeing someone move it off of the holder? No, I didn't see anybody move it off of the holder, sir. So it wasn't placed there in order for uh, you specifically to examine it in that location. Is that a fair statement? No, I searched that area of the house, sir. OK. So um, I'm going to uh, ask you now, I had a couple of screenshots taken 
from, I think it's Exhibit 7, we had uh, Detective Clabby had a video. I took, took a couple of screenshots from it, and I'm just going to show you um, if I can. Excuse me, may I have a moment with counsel? Yes. Yeah. What time is this? Tell me a second. I'm going to have this marked if I may. Yes. So I'm going to show you is there any uh, objection to um, exhibit A? That's those. That's this one, or this one? Yeah, that's this one. That one. A. No objection, thank you. What's the marking, please? Defense exhibit A. Defense A admitted as a full exhibit. So if you could, um, you, before we show you the image, before you got there, you know that Detective Clavy was also on the scene, is that right? Um, well, we were there at the same time, sir. Fair enough. Did you all arrive in the van, or did you come separately? No, we came separately. But you recall seeing him there? Yes. You knew that he was assigned the videography for that scene that day? Yes. Did you observe him doing any videography? Yes. Did he do that, at least the, the overview, before you got to work making any uh, uh, examples, any swaps, or anything like that, taking anything? Yes. All right, so I'm going to show you a, a couple of screenshots from that from that um, video that Detective Clavy took. And you did, have you seen that video at any point? Uh, not in a long time, sir. All right, so I'm going to show you uh, one screenshot called uh, Screenshot. Can we just put that up, please? Now, looking at the uh, video screenshot that I've just put up here, you see that the paper towel is on the dispenser in that image, correct? Correct. So my question to you, was that how it was when you observed it, or was it already off the roll when you uh, examined it? Objection. Um, Asked and answered, Your Honor. He indicated he doesn't remember. Well, the response has been he does not remember. All right. Does that help? All right. Does looking at this image help you uh, refresh your recollection as to whether or not uh, it was on the dispenser when you arrived. Objection, Your Honor. Grounds. Again, it's he's been asked and answered. It's now a full exhibit. Um, well, the, I'll, I'll withdraw. I'll withdraw the question. I'll withdraw the question. I'm going to show you another um, screenshot in a moment, but well, it's up there now. This is from the pantry. Do you recall looking in the pantry at the uh, in that kitchen? Between the kitchen and the mudroom. In uh, between the mudroom and the dining room, sir. Yes. Um, yes. All right. So if you would just put up that image, this is also from the same exhibit. Do you recall that this was the view of that uh, pantry when you looked at it? Um, yes, that's consistent. Did you take any swabs or collect any evidence from what's shown in that uh, image? I did not. Could I have this mark, please? I would uh, offer exhibit, defense exhibit B. No objection. No, sir. Defense B admitted as a full exhibit.
I'm going to show you an image that was taken from the uh, by the officer who arrived at New Canaan Police uh, from the New Canaan Police Department on the evening of May 24th, 2019. All right, so if we could have that. I don't know if you don't recognize the uh, New Canaan police officer that's seen in this image, do you? Uh, no. And I'll just note the time is indicated at 5.24.19 at uh, 19.57 and 33. This is from State's Exhibit uh, 1, I believe, which was the video that was from the body camera of the one of the patrol officers that was there that night. Okay? Okay. So again, I'm just going to ask you to um, note Did you ever see the paper towel roll on the dispenser that when you were at the uh, house? I don't remember. Now I'm also going to show you two other images. Um, I think uh, they're also from this exhibit. X8, please. It's image 0064 from that exhibit. Do you recall seeing any of the items that are indicated here during your, your investigation on May 25th, 2019, inside the home? Uh, specific items? Any specific items in the pantry that we're seeing here? Uh, no. I'll show you the next picture, please, which is... Um, it's image 0065, or I'm just calling it X21 for my, uh, does this particular roll, did you observe this roll of, of paper towel in the pantry at six, at, at Wells Lane when you were there collecting it? Uh, I don't remember that. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures from the uh, from the garage that we've already been through and uh, you described where you took certain uh, swabs. The first picture I want to show you is uh, from your from your disc exhibit, which I believe the whole exhibit is I think seven. I'm sorry, I'll just have a moment. Which one? Nine. The, no. large, the large disc. What do you no, the one that we put in yesterday. Is that? Yes. Nine. It is nine. Okay. Nine. Yeah. Sure. I'm going to show you some images from, from uh, Exhibit 9, if I may. And um, the first exhibit I want to ask you about is um, Mark on your Exhibit 9 is 12 362. If that, we could have that up on the screen, please. Recall this is the exhibit that you marked as A16, or somebody marked as A16, correct? Uh, I don't think that was an exhibit. I think that was just for documentation purposes. All right. So right. Let, let me also get that clarification. If there's a yellow placard, then it was then it was seized as some kind of an exhibit for your purposes of your investigation. Is that correct? Or it was marked on a on a similar label with EX. Whatever. So the A letter was was that your writing on this document on this mm, image? No. This would be something that the whichever detective was placing these markers down would have noted. Is that right? Yes. And I asked you this when we were first putting some of these pictures up. If we look at this image here, when you saw the um, this particular marker, did you note the um, 
the marking on the sticker itself. No, I didn't note it. You did not? No. Okay. So you don't know how that got there? Specifically, no. Okay. I'm going to show you another image. This one is 13-363. Um, it's in the same series. And um, this is also one of the images that you testified to yesterday, correct? Uh, yes. And I'm going to ask you specifically about the mark on the middle of this document here. Was that present when you were examining that particular uh, spot on the, on the ground? I, I don't remember it. You don't recall seeing that? No. And you also testified, if I'm not mistaken, that there was also a fair amount of, you called it vegetative matter, seeds or leaves and whatnot on this garage floor, correct? Yes. And you, did you gather any of those? No. Um, show you one more uh, in this series. This would be 14-157. Uh, Once again, I'm just going to ask you whether or not you recognize or saw this item on the placard when you were uh, looking at this particular location on the floor. I don't recall it being there. And when you talk about other items, whatnot, seeds and whatnot on the floor, are we talking about, if we look at this picture, are we talking about all of these other specific items, dots and whatnot that we see on the cement floor in a close-up? Is that what you're talking about? Um, yes. There are also some larger leaves, correct? Larger leaves, well, stones, sand, things like that. Sand, what else? Uh, small stones. Before All just on the, what you might expect to find on a garage floor. Before correct? you proceed, counsel, the court needs to clarify something that is quite subtle. Detective Riley, on the previous photograph, you indicated you did not remember whether you saw that spot on the measuring marker, correct? Uh, that's that's what I said yesterday. But Your then Honor. you said, I don't recall seeing it. Now, it may sound the same, but there's subtle differences. I don't remember whether I saw it. To this court means I don't remember whether it was there or not. I don't recall seeing it means in this court's view, I don't remember that it was there. Which one is it? It was the former. I did not take note of it, Your Honor. Thank you. With regard to the um, search of the um, Chevy, you said that you were sent back to take additional uh, samples in October of 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. And as I understand from your testimony, it was from additional samples of the steering wheel? Uh, yes. From the interior of the left front door? Yes. From the front seat adjustment control? Yes. From the rear view mirror? Yes. From the cargo area? Yes. From the <coughs> rear seat controls? Uh, weren't those one and the same, sir? Well, that was going to be my next question. Were those separate places, or did you take them from the rear seat controls in the cargo area because the seats were down? Uh, yeah, I believe what I remember, the rear seat controls were in the cargo area. Because the back seat, the second row of seats were not up, they were down. Is that why you entered that way? I don't remember whether okay. they were up or down, sir. You were sent back to do additional swabs because the first set didn't produce any information of value. Is that Objection. True? Well, the question is, you were sent back to take additional swabs because the first set didn't yield uh, anything of evidentiary value. 
And what's the objection? It's a mischaracterization of evidence assumes facts not in evidence. Um, and, uh, well, and it calls for a hearsay answer, Your Honor. Well, let's take them one at a time. The question was, you were sent back. That's one segment because what you swabbed the first time did not yield anything of evidentiary value. But whether you were sent back or not is not material. It's the second segment. Because what you recovered the first time was of no evidentiary value. Well, that assumes in this court's view, facts that can be interpreted differently, but in this court's view, specifically, it's misleading. Sustain. The purpose of going back in October was an attempt to get biological material from those locations in the, in the suburban, correct? Yes. And whatever you did, you made uh, the same kind of swipe type activity that you've described earlier? Uh, yes. And then you sent that on to the, to the state lab at some point, right? Uh, me, I don't know if I did personally, but um, that's the usual process. Right. Well, well, let me just, I'll, I skipped a step, all right? So you gathered it, and it was then sent into evidence, right? Uh, yes. And then at some point, it was that was done for the purpose of at some point having it examined by the state forensic laboratory, correct? I believe so. Not sure though, sir. Well, whether these particular items were then sent on or not, that would have been the purpose of collecting it, right? Oh yes, absolutely. Just have a moment. I have no further questions. Thank you. Is there redirect? Um, just a couple of questions, if I can. Uh, Detective Riley, uh, do you recall Attorney Schoenhorn asking you about the other items that a presumptive test could test positive for? Do you recall that line of questioning? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I think some of the things he questioned were about radishes. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, in the garage floor, uh, did you find any evidence of radishes anywhere? No. Okay, what about um, cheeseburgers anywhere on the floor? No cheeseburgers. No. What about on the undercarriage of the Chevy Suburban? Uh, did you find any cheeseburgers or radishes there? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, what about the undercarriage of the Land Rover? Any cheeseburgers or radishes there? No. What about turmeric? Any bottles of turmeric or turmeric sources on the floor of the garage? No, ma'am. The Land Rover? No. Uh, the Chevy Suburban? No. All right. Uh, with respect to the cargo area of the Chevy Suburban, um, did you find any uh, evidence of car seats? Any evidence that children were sitting in the trunk area? In the back? No, ma'am. Uh, with respect to that cargo area, did you see a lot of exposed steel in the rust areas? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, with respect to... Actually, that's all I have. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. In any of those areas, starting with the garage, do you find evidence of rust stains? Not that I remember, sir. Do you notice it whether or not under the undercarriage of the vehicle there was some rust? Um, yes. No further questions. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Detective Riley. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Time is now 3.10. Uh, you have another witness for this afternoon. Do you we know? do, Your Honor. Judge, we do well, have to take up a couple of matters correct. in advance. So what the court is going to do is allow uh, the jury to take the afternoon recess now. <coughs> well, how long do you anticipate uh, your argument on the matter that we have to take up? I think probably 15 minutes, Your Honor.
So we'll allow the recess now. It may be that the recess, ladies and gentlemen, will be a little more extended than usual. We hope you're not disappointed. We'll stand in our uh, afternoon recess.
Honorable Superior Court is now opening back in session. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you. understand there is a matter to be taken up. Yes, Judge. Uh, good afternoon. May it please the court. Your Honor, there's actually two matters that we're asking that the court take up at this time. Um, you'll recall late on Friday, the state inquired about the court hearing the defendant's motion for a porter hearing with respect to STR Mix, which is um, a deconvolution software that the state laboratory uses when interpreting DNA results. We did file a written objection on Friday, which I did email to the court. Um, and uh, we're asking that that be heard now, or at least at some point today, um, because we were intending on introducing DNA evidence as early as tomorrow, depending on scheduling, of course. And then there's a motion that deals specifically with the next witness, which was filed by the defense last week, which was specifically to exclude any and all evidence of um, so-called marital discord between Mr. Fotis Dulos and Miss Jennifer Dulos, um, along with uh, hearsay. So that is going to be coming up during the next witness, and so I certainly didn't want to run through the stop sign of the motion in limine. Thank you. So the court will take up first the, as we would have to call it, what the code calls it, prior bad act. If I could just have a moment, Your Honor. I apologize, Your Honor. I'm just looking for it uh, written out. Well, I'll probably be able to do it from memory in any event, Your Honor. So I'll, I'll, I'll just note, Your Honor, um, just a couple of things with, with respect to the so-called uh, prior bad acts. Um, firstly, this is a defense objection, but we are going to be making the offer. So I just want to alert the court as to um, what we intend on offering through this next witness. Um, and they've also moved to exclude uh, alleged hearsay statements from Jennifer Farber-Dulos as well, and I'd like to uh, take those up at the appropriate time. Uh, additionally, Your Honor, but um, essentially, Your Honor, um, the defense in this case, as I understand it, from some of the cross-examination which we have heard so far, specifically with respect to presumptive blood tests, as I understand the defense, they are not conceding that there was actually blood in the garage. They're not conceding that Jennifer Dulos is deceased, and they're not conceding that Fotis Dulos is responsible for her murder. Now, I could stand mistaken on that, but I don't think that we're gonna be hearing those concessions this afternoon from the defense. So I bring this up, Your Honor, because obviously, in light of the fact that none of those things are conceded at this point, the court needs to decide whether or not animus between Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos is relevant to this case. And I did file um, a written objection this morning, Your Honor. But I would pose to the court this hypothetical as the court considers this motion. I want the court to consider if the defense had moved to exclude any and all mention of the fact that Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos were married. Let's just say they had moved to exclude that and the court granted their motion. The jury would naturally be sitting here wondering why Fotis Dulos would have murdered a random woman in Ukraine. It is the story of their marriage and the story of their discord and the story of their divorce that served as the motivation that culminated in the death and murder of Dulos. <coughs> that is our theory of the case. And Miss Lauren Almeida, 
is going to be testifying on behalf of the state in just a moment. And what the evidence is going to reveal, Your Honor, is that she was the uh, nanny for the Dulos family from 2012 until 2019. And she was present for a series of events, including the breakup of Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos in the spring and summertime of 2017. And she's going to be detailing very specific events for the court. Specifically, she's going to be detailing how, um, upon the decision to separate between Dulos and Chase, Jennifer Dulos around with a piece of paper, that at one point there was they were in some type of screaming match and he chased Jennifer Dulos upstairs and burst into the room. Um, that she looked terrified when he was um, chasing after her. She's going to testify about the antagonistic behavior he showed towards her during those months um, leading up to her finally leaving the home. Um, specifically, Your Honor, that he had threatened to take the children to Greece. Um, she's going to talk about an event in which he allowed the 11-year-old children and the 8-year-old children to drive his Porsche uh, around a very uh, dangerous uh, area, um, thus upsetting Jennifer that these uh, things um, were occurring and seemed to be designed to antagonize Jennifer during the months after they had apparently decided to separate but were still living together. She's going to detail for the court how he reacted when Jennifer surreptitiously left the home with the children in June of 2017, that he acted erratically towards her in court, her being Lauren Almeida, that he accused her of kidnapping her kids because she went with Jennifer with the children to New York. She's going to discuss the fact that Fotis Dulos um, yelled at her when she dropped the kids off and said that she needed to be the voice of reason with his wife, Jennifer Dulos. Um, all of these things, Your Honor, are probative to Mr. Dulos's um, animus towards Jennifer Dulos and serve as the motivation for why he, he would commit this crime. Because the evidence is gonna show that despite the fact that it had been nearly two years from Jennifer Dulos leaving the home until um, her alleged murder, that they still weren't divorced. That they were in the midst of ongoing um, marital discord. And the defendant, Your Honor, actually spoke about that marital discord during her interviews with the police. She indicated that, I don't know the exact phrase, but I believe it was two years of hell or two years of torture when she was speaking about uh, Mr. Dulos' divorce proceedings with his uh, then wife, um, Jennifer Dulos. She joked about how she wished Jennifer would just disappear. So this also serves as the motive for why the defendant would conspire with Mr. Dulos to kill Jennifer Dulos. And as the defense has repeatedly said during voir dire, the state has to prove beyond reasonable doubt that Otis Dulos murdered Jennifer Dulos. They have repeatedly said that. So the fact that Fotis Dulos would have been motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos and all of the discord leading up and explaining that motivation is highly probative to Mr. Dulos' intent, his motivation, whether or not he would have conspired with the defendant, his live-in girlfriend. It also goes directly to an element of the case that the state has to prove. And so, you know, if we look at some of the jurisprudence in the state, and I think I directed the court to State versus Lopez, 280 Con 795, just as an example, anytime there has been sort of hostile acts towards the same victim, courts have routinely held that that is probative of the actor's intent and motivation. So, unless the defense is conceding that Mr. Dulos committed this crime, that Jennifer Dulos is deceased, the probative value of this was extremely high before their cross examinations, it's astronomically high now. And so I am asking that the court uh, allow Ms. Almeida to testify about those events. There was an additional event which I neglected to mention, which was shortly, um, I don't want to say shortly, but after Jennifer Dulos had left the home, there was an event in which Mr. Dulos almost hit her with the car. And Ms. Almeida returned to the home 
shortly after, and Jennifer Dulos explained that situation to her. And she was extremely shaken up. And um, all of these things, Judge, we believe are probative again to the animus that we would have harbored uh, towards her. With respect to, um, and if I could just have one moment, Judge? Yeah. With respect to the um, alleged hearsay statements, I would just indicate the following to the court. Number one, the statements that we're going to be offering that Jennifer made to Ms. Almeida are either not being offered for their truth or meet a well-recognized hearsay exception. And I just want to give you some examples. Barber's then existing belief that Dulos was having an affair in part because he had been more distant. We're not going to be offering that to show that Mr. Dulos was actually more distant in the marriage. We're going to be offering it to show that Jennifer Dulos believed that their marriage was in turmoil and believed he was having an affair. Her then existing belief that she had found proof of the affair. Her future intention to confront Dulos about the affair. Her then existing fear of Dulos. Her then existing emotional state that she was not in love with Dulos anymore. Her then existing fear that the defendant would take her children to Greece and not return, which by the way is independently corroborated. Lauren Almeida actually witnessed an event where he threatened to take the children to Greece. Her intention to divorce Dulos. Her then existing hope that the divorce proceedings would go smoothly. Her intention to leave the defendant, including her future plan to surreptitiously leave the house, and her fear that Dulos would find out. Her request that Lauren Almeida continue to work with her after she had left Dulos. And her intention to take the Chevrolet Suburban to a doctor's appointment in New York on May 24, 2019. All of those things, Your Honor, just by way of example, are then existing state of mind, statements of an intention to do something in the immediate future, and therefore qualify as a state of mind exception under 83, subsection 4 of the Connecticut Code of Ethics. So um, they're not testimonial. There's no suggestion that these statements were made in anticipation of any criminal uh, proceeding. They're made to the nanny, um, and she, that's what she's going to be testifying to, Judge. So all of these things, again, the well-recognized hearsay exceptions I would direct the court. There's a more recent case, State versus Ayala. But I also directed the court in our memorandum to State versus NIMS. Victim statements as to others as to why he was traveling to Connecticut, specifically that he was concerned with how the defendant was handling his sister's affairs. It was not offered for the truth, but rather to explain why the victim went to Connecticut. State versus Smith, victim statements to others. Uh, excuse me. Um, with respect to the statements about the event with the car, Your Honor, we're offering those as spontaneous utterances. And um, I would just indicate that State versus Smith, which is 275 con at 217, quote, it is well established in our jurisprudence that where a marital or romantic relationship existed between a homicide victim and the defendant, evidence of the victim's fear of the defendant suggests a deterioration of that relationship, which is relevant to the issues of motive and intent. Now what I'm gathering from the defense, even though they're apparently not conceding that Mr. Dulos is even responsible for this crime or that the crime occurred at all, is that there's somehow spillover prejudice to the defendant. Um, but again, um, this is highly probative evidence as to why Mr. Dulos would commit this crime. We're going to flush out later on in the trial why it was also probative to why the defendant would conspire with Mr. Dulos. And so we're asking that the court allow this evidence. We think it's very probative. Thank you. Attorney Schoenhorn. <clears throat> I guess we have to separate the fact, two, two issues here. The first is that it sounds to me that if Fotis Dulos was on trial for this, the state would be seeking to offer this kind of evidence, and most of it would be explicitly prohibited against uh, Mr. Dulos because of its prejudicial uh, effect and its remoteness. This court, early on, when, before we started uh, evidence, I attempted to get certain documents from the divorce file because it sounds to me that the state wants to litigate a dissolution action that never reached its conclusion. The court, in the most recent 
court proceedings involving the Dulos versus Dulos matter prohibited the defense from having access to those documents. I want to preface my remarks with that because what I'm hearing now is the state wants to litigate matters from 2016 and 2017, years before the uh, uh, disappearance of Jennifer Dulos and the allegations that are set forth in the complaint. So first, there, there are a number of, of issues that apply here. The first is that most of what I just heard is not relevant because it has nothing to do with Michelle Draconis. It also would not be relevant as a motive against Fotis Dulos because of the fact of, that it occurred before the divorce. It's also relevant for your court's determination. There's no violence involved here. Every one of the cases that the, the, that the state has cited involve prior acts of actual physical violence. What we have here are arguments, arguments about whether the children should uh, go water skiing, whether they were loud, whether they, somebody wanted, whether Mr. Dulos wanted his wife to sign a, a, um, a custody agreement, which is what the claim chasing her around, quote unquote, with a piece of paper is all about. To sign an agreement as to when the children would go, in other words, without litigating it, to agree to those terms. This might be true of any dissolution action, not only in Connecticut, but probably in the entire United States of America. So the, the problem we also have, which is unique to this case, is the, that all of these incidents were part of an attempt by Jennifer Dulos to obtain a restraining order. I want to emphasize, because the court may not be aware, Judge Collin had a multi-day hearing where all of these claims were litigated, and he found it not credible. That is, he denied the restraining order. So we have, for, at the level of a preponderance of the evidence, a coordinate judge of this court finding that the evidence did not met, meet the minimum requirements for a restraining order, and he denied uh, Jennifer Dulos's motion uh, for, for um, a restraining order. Again, it is testimonial in another coordinate proceeding. It was done for purposes of litigation. These allegations were made during the course of that. It was denied in that court. So how is the court here going to allow the same evidence in here without bringing in the actual findings, rulings by the judge in the divorce case, and then of course, this all goes back to 2016 and 2017. The fact that there were uh, there was di that, that kind of discord is not the kind of violence that would permit the court to uh, permit to allow that to be presented, especially in a case of this nature. The um, the police were not involved at that point. There's no contemporaneous documentation. Again, this was something that was prepared in affidavits for purposes of court. Ms. Almeida testified in support of the uh, motion for a uh, restraining order. I think it's important also to realize that to the extent that there has to be reference to the fact that it was an ongoing dissolution matter, perhaps it's also relevant that uh, Ms. Almeida was part of the planned by Ms. Dulos to simply disappear from the house and leave without notice and to ignore the police inquiry, which is what, what happened back then. If the court looks at some of the cases, for example, um, State versus Espinal is a good example of that, where we talk about whether or not claims, and, and it, there are a couple of, I have to separate this out because on the one hand you've got couple of incidents where Miss Almeida witnessed arguments between Fotis Dulos and his wife. Um, there was no physical touching whatsoever. It was following and yelling. That was the nature of it. Then we have a hearsay statement that Jennifer told the babysitter that 
Fotis drove into the driveway recklessly, apparently telling her that he was allowing the children to drive the, one of his cars, to drive the Porsche. These were issues that she found to be unreasonable. It may have been part of the reason that she, she wanted to leave. And yes, there may be evidence that she, quote, found out that Mr. Dulos was having an affair. But again, that is a far cry from suggesting it is relevant to a claim motive two and a half years later, at least over two years later, to do away with his wife. Particularly, Your Honor, and this is why Your Honor's past ruling plays a role here. Everyone who was involved in the, in the that was involved with Mr. Dulos, his lawyers, the guardian ad litem, other people that were aware of it, knew that the report by the independent evaluator, the custodial uh, evaluator, the psychologist, had recommended that Mr. Dulos was the better parent, that he, was, that he was a better, more caring parent than Jennifer, and that therefore he was recommending joint equal custody, noting that Jennifer Dulos was opposed to that, and that Jennifer Dulos was refusing to turn over her psychiatric records so we could evaluate more uh, uh, in more detail whether or not she needed some additional counseling and whatnot to help facilitate the transition to joint custody. I submit, Your Honor, that opening up that can of worms is going to permit all of that, including the evidence that, the, that Dr. Herman testified which is why I was trying to get those, those transcripts, which the court denied uh, my right to have them, even though I submit under Davis versus Alaska, now would be relevant to the issue of right to cross-examine anyone who's going to be testifying about hearsay about the, the discord and the divorce. Why is that also important, as Your Honor may recall, if any hearsay is allowed in, under our rules, it allows the opposing party to bring in any other hearsay as if the speaker was actually on the stand. And all of that would suddenly become relevant. It could actually delay this trial by having a week of testimony about who was the better parent, who was, quote, winning, unquote, in the divorce proceeding, which I assume that's not what we're here for. In State versus um, a couple of cases, I just want to bring to Your Honor's attention. In State versus Espinal, for example, there was some evidence about the, um, the marriage being uh, discord, but in that case, there was actual violence, and it was relevant because it showed the current state of fear of the spouse when, the, when, there was, when she disappeared. This is something, again, that goes back years, and there is no evidence, none of recent discord. In fact, Your Honor will here at this trial that there was a party two days before at the New Canaan house. I don't know if Your Honor is even aware that this occurred, but there, there was a party at the house where Mr. Dulos was present, the children were there, the independent uh, evaluator was present as well, and uh, there was a sharing of food between Jennifer and her still husband at that time. So that, that's going to come in no matter what. That comes in. But to suggest that the babysitter should be allowed to say, well, they were arguing, they were screaming, whether or not uh, he, at one point while they were still married, threatened to take the children to Greece. That has nothing to do with what's going on at the time where an evaluator, within three to four weeks of the disappearance, had concluded in an 80-page report, which I'll note I have, that says that Mr. Dulos would be the better parent for these children, but he was recommending equal uh, sharing of custody in this case. There's also the case, Your Honor, State versus um, Reynolds, where even though the court allowed in a narrow, narrow amount of evidence regarding the uh, uh, a claim of seeking a restraining order that never was filed, it was only application of, its, of itself. None of the affidavit, none of the specifics of it, and the court was required to give a very, very specific um, 
cautionary instruction that could not be considered for the truth of the matter. But as I hear what Mr. McGinnis is saying, he wants this all to be about a claim motive that he was yelling at his, there was an argument going on years, a few years before, not in the interim. It's not was like it was ongoing. Two years before, before she filed for divorce. And then everything else went through the court. They were using the court process the way it was intended to. She made claims, they were denied. They were in the process of trying to work out issues such as finances. They were working out uh, the custodial arrangement. Mr. Dulos was meeting with, was seeing his children, albeit, albeit at that time there was an order that he had to have a, uh, an independent supervisor because he had apparently told one of his children, according to the file, had told one of his children to uh, not mention uh, the fact that he had uh, Mr. Conus moving into the house with her own daughter. And so as a result of that, they had issued an order he could, for a period of time that he could only see his children with an independent evaluator present, which was done, which was documented, which occurred on a regular basis. So I'm not suggesting that the, that the state can't bring up that there was an ongoing divorce. Number one, the only thing that Ms. Almeida knows about it is hearsay. She might have read some documents. She might have heard, talked to the lawyer for Ms. Dulos because she did testify at that hearing. But again, that's an out-of-court statement, testimonial in nature. Therefore, all of that is both a, not only hearsay, but it's a, a denial of right to confront and cross-examine because it was testimonial in nature. That is, for purposes of legal process. And it doesn't matter, it's not this case, it was for a divorced case that was in litigation at that point. Let's see if I've covered, there might be one more point I wanted to make. I think the state was trying to argue that when Ms. Dulos told the babysitter Ms. Almeida certain things, I assume he's trying to argue they were some kind of uh, spontaneous, excited utterances, but even the way he explained it just now suggested that she later told her about it, and so therefore you, one cannot even claim that it happened under the, uh, without the opt opportunity for contemplation, that it happened suddenly that it was spontaneous in that sense. Um, and I note that the uh, Reynolds case, it was two months, one to two months after the prior incidents, it was still considered relevant. This is years uh, later, and it did not involve any violence. <clears throat> Finally, and I, I should mention this, uh, there, there was a suggestion in, in one of the documents, and I think by Miss by Miss Almeida, that Jennifer told her that Mr. Dulles had per at one point had purchased a firearm. Now, when the restraining order was filed, that was turned into the Farmington Police, and it was never, to anyone's knowledge, ever recovered. It was never returned to Mr. Dulos at any time. But I assume, since the state didn't mention that, it has no intention of trying to elicit that, because there are several cases, the one that comes to mind is State versus Gerald Lamo from the mid-'80s, I think, that said that any mention of a firearm, when there's no evidence of firearms in the case, is one of the most prejudicial things that could happen in front of a jury. And I note that, especially in this day and age, where there's you know, all these mass shootings and all these, uh, on almost a daily basis, that would be so prejudicial for that to be blurted out that there'd be no way, short of a mistrial, that that could be remediated at that point. Finally, there's no such thing as transferred motive. So even if this arguably, to a minimal extent, and with a very truncated uh, offer of proof was admissible against Mr. Dulos. There's no, there's, transferred intent is if um, I throw a rock and I'm trying to hit uh, victim A and it misses and hits victim B, that's, there's a transferred intent 
in the at door to uh, the, vic the second victim. It's not reciprocal, however, and it doesn't go to another person who's standing to the side. It's just not relevant. Um, and it certainly can't be used because it would even predate the allegation of a conspiracy or anything of that nature. And therefore, there's no way to attribute that knowledge and those specific incidents to Ms. Traconis under any circumstances anyway. The fact that the divorce kept going is one thing. The fact that she said in her statement to the police that it was like, I think the term is two years of hell, doesn't mean that the specific acts of misconduct, of mis alleged acts against Mr. Tr uh, Mr. Dulos then can be applied to Ms. Traconis. With, I'll just mention very briefly, there's been some suggestion that it goes to state of mind. Whatever the state of mind is of Jennifer Dulos is not covered in this case under either 8-3 subsection 2 or 8-3 subsection 4. Telling her that I'm going to be taking a certain vehicle to New York, for example, although not particularly prejudicial, is you know, I'm, I'm only raising it because that's not the kind of state of mind that would be relevant to the examination. The fact that she was going to New York might be and then didn't show up. That is relevant, but to suggest that one person said, I'm going to be taking one vehicle and you have a choice of two is not the kind of evidence that goes to the state of mind. It's just not relevant or material in this case. Let me just see if I've, um, make sure I've covered everything. There's one last point that, what I see is happening here is the state whole theory so far seems to be that they're gonna tar Ms. Traconis with what happened that may or may not have involved Mr. Dulos directly. He was on trial, maybe some of this with a cautionary instruction might be admissible, but it's not only so remote as to Mr. Dulos. When you try and drag my client into this, we've now gone so far off the playing field, we're out of the stadium, we're not even in the parking lot, we're down the street by the highway exit. And that is what we seem to be doing here. None of this evidence applies to Ms. Traconis, and therefore, it is so highly prejudicial. The state has been allowed a lot of leeway. I would suggest more than I believe. You know, I'm not shy about objecting, as the court probably has noticed. But in any event, the, the, that I believe has already gone so far down, uh, given the, the state leeway to put on evidence that will later not be uh, connected. And so for them to be able to put on such evidence, leave that speculation out there, only later on to show it has nothing to do with Ms. Traconis. And some of it, in fact, has nothing to do with Mr. Dulos either, but I'm not objecting on that basis. But here we have a witness who can testify to certain things that occurred on that week. We're not objecting to any of the stuff that happened during the month of May of 2019, including the fact there were some court proceedings going on. But what happened at them, what the rulings were, what motions were being filed, any of that is both testimonial and therefore it violates the Confrontation Clause of the state and federal constitution, as well as inadmissible hearsay. Based on that, Your Honor, I didn't hear the state separating out its claim. He just made all these things as if he's going to get into all of them. Some of them I might not object to, since he didn't say one, two, three, or four, he just said, this is all what we're gonna bring in. I'm not gonna suggest which ones he might be able to get into that way that he wouldn't object. Attorney McGinnis. Yes, Judge. And I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that we have a jury waiting. I did just wanna to respond to a few things. Uh, firstly, I, I'm not gonna get into you know, who has a better theory of the case at this point, because as near as I can tell, the defense's theory is that Jennifer Dulos, shortly before disappearing, ran over a squirrel in her garage that was eating a cheeseburger, okay? 
So the issue yeah, I'm going to court to such pejorative, sarcastic remarks. Well, 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 before we proceed, there's no jury in the courtroom. The court can understand <coughs> the cut and thrust of argument. The court is not going to rule on an objection that is not evidentiary. can understand that against some comments counsel either for the defense or for the state may take offense but unless those comments become unprofessional the court is going to allow both parties to Ride the wave of zeal. So, Judge, just uh, responding to some of the specific things with respect to this is issue of remoteness, we're talking about an ongoing discord over the course of two years leading up to Jennifer Dulos' death. And even by the defense's own argument at this point, uh, shortly, apparently, before Jennifer Dulos disappeared and we believe was murdered, there was some report which she was opposed to, thus indicating further uh, animus and discord between the parties. I would also just note, Your Honor, that in terms of the balancing that the court has to do, I think the defense sort of made our argument for us, which was that none of these acts involve a particularly uh, violent act on behalf of Mr. Dulo. So in terms of whether or not this is gonna somehow inflame the passions of the jury, uh, I don't think that the court needs to worry about that because the acts themselves are substantially less probative than the allegation that he murdered um, Ms. Dulos. I did not mention a gun. I did not mention a restraining order in my argument. I tried to keep my offer of proof to what I intend on showing um, through this witness, and we spent an inordinate amount of time talking about things that weren't part of our offer of proof. I'll also just indicate, Your Honor, that th when the defense said that if hearsay is admitted, any other hearsay from that person can be admissible. I'm not familiar with a case that stands for that proposition. I'm obviously familiar with the rule of completeness, um, but any other hearsay, I'd love to see that case. Uh, so I don't think the court has to worry about there somehow being an undue consumption of time. And just because the defense attorney says that something's testimonial doesn't make it so. Um, they have not cited a single case that any of the statements, which they've been on notice of, that Lauren Almeida is going to testify to, that Ms. Barber Dulos made to her, are somehow testimonial in nature. So I would ask the court um, allow us to, uh, to have the witness testify to the specific acts that we've talked about, and um, just ask the court to deny their objection. Thank you. Well, the court is going to scan a few items using a grocery store analogy. First, counsel spent in almost every case of every juror about at least one hour to determine which jurors would be appropriate jurors for this case. One of the salient questions to the jury concerned the ability to pay attention. And that was uh, with regard to the anticipated number of hours of video evidence. Well, the court is going to credit the jury with being able to pay attention beyond many hours of video evidence. So the fact that some evidence may hang for a while before being picked up is not a reason for this court to believe that this jury cannot tie up evidence when it is time for them to deliberate. Secondly, there is a discussion between testimonial and non-testimonial hearsay. So the court has to Harken to Crawford v. Washington. If the testimony is non, rather, if the evidence is non-testimonial, then the 
rules of evidence would apply. If the evidence is testimonial, then that evidence cannot run afoul of the defense's right under the Sixth Amendment. But we leave that discussion there. It was indicated by, not indicated, it was stated by the defense that this court would have to relitigate the family matter, the dissolution matter. This court in no way litigates the dissolution matter. The dissolution matter involves testimony and rulings concerning alimony, pendente lite, and post-judgment, child support, pendente lite, custody, pendente lite, and after dissolution, visitation, health insurance costs, educational costs, exclusive use and possession of the marital home, pendente lite, and post-judgment. This court is not litigating the family matter. So that premise is without merit. Under our rules, prior bad acts may not be admissible to prove bad character, criminal tendencies, or proclivity. However, prior bad acts may be admitted for other purposes, such as motive, malice, intent, identity, knowledge, absence of mistake or accident, a system of criminal activity, common scheme or plan, evidence that will help corroborate crucial prosecution testimony, or to prove an element of the offense. Nevertheless, if prior bad acts are admitted, the probative value has to outweigh the danger of unfair prejudice. So the court cannot remember the, the court will refer to it as the grocery list of statements from the next witness. However, the court cannot at this point determine where those groceries will go until it hears more from the witness. In this case, as the court has stated before in discussions with counsel, the hearsay exception of state of mind cannot consume every thought that the declarant had and make it available to the jury. Because then that exception becomes the rule. In this court's view, the then existing mental or emotional condition of the declarant has to be focused. In other words, it's not just a matter of what the declarant said under a certain set of circumstances. The exception goes to the mental or emotional state. For example, fear or anxiety or terror. So simply everything that Jennifer Farber Dulos may have said to the housekeeper from what the court heard from the state would not fall into that category. But the court would have to hear the testimony. So concerning the issue of prior bad acts and what may be admissible, the court at this point understands that the testimony can go to malice and motive. However, 
everything that is said does not go to malice and motive as expressed from what the court understood the state plans to elicit. So the court will be keen to entertain the objections if it appears, even if it does not appear, that simply everything Jennifer Farber Dulo said to her housekeeper is coming into evidence. That is not the court's understanding of the state of mind exception to the hearsay rule. So the court is going to allow testimony of marital discord. However, the fact that there is marital discord in this court's view is not exceedingly probative. It's whether or not the statements by Jennifer Farber Dulos go to motive to murder, her fear, her anxiety, her terror. Not simply whether she did not like something that Fotis Dulos was doing. So the court is going to allow testimony of marital discord, but the court will be keen to essentially use a calendar, a colander, to determine what is relevant and what is not. Do we need to take you know, the Porter factors and the discussion of Porter is going to take up too much time right now. The jury is out. However, the state's witness is probably not going to be done today. We still have a half hour. So That's what the court would prefer to do is take up the next witness tomorrow morning, take up the Porter argument. That's, that's fine with the state judge. I'll just note that um, what we're probably going to do then is not ask the representative from the laboratory to come tomorrow. Depending on the court's ruling, we'd ask that she come on Thursday. Well, what's the, well, the lineup for tomorrow is probably going to be Ms. Almeida, correct? Correct. And after Ms. Almeida? We have Detective Tom Patton. But I don't anticipate his testimony is going to be terribly long. But Ms. Almeida may take a, a substantial portion of the day. Thank you. So we'll start now with Ms. Almeida. A quick question, Your Honor. Um, if the court is going to allow some of the marital discord testimony, will the court give a, a cautionary instruction to the jury about the limited nature of that testimony, and specifically in light of the fact that it's only well, it's relevant to maybe the, the allegation involving Mr. Dulos, but is even one step further removed from Mr. Combs in that regard. Well, the court will consider limiting instruction after both the state and the defense have had the opportunity to cross-examine and of examine tomatoes. Your Honor, uh, I'll, I'll wait for the jury, then I'll call this one. to stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors? Please. Yes, Judge. Your Honor, the state calls Lauren Almeida. Thank you. 
Sanctuary or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, shall help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Lauren Almeida, L-A-U-R-E-N-A-L-M-E-I-D-A. -E and your business address? Um, well, there's no need for a business address. Yeah. You may be seated. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Almeida. Good afternoon. Ms. Almeida, how old are you? 32. And where did you grow up? Newington, Connecticut. Who do you um, currently live with? I live with um, the Dulos kids. And did you graduate high school? I did. Which high school did you attend? Uh, Newington High School. Could you just keep your voice up just a little bit? Newington High School. And uh, did you also attend college? Yes. Where did you go to school? Uh, University of Connecticut. And what did you study at the University of Connecticut? Psychology. Did you graduate? Yes. What year did you graduate? 2013. And uh, you mentioned that you currently live with the Dulos children. Mm -hmm. Did you know someone by the name of Jennifer Dulos? Yes. When was the last time you saw or spoke to Jennifer? May 24th, 2019. And did you know someone by the name of Fotis Dulos? Yes. How did you know Jennifer and Fotis Dulos? Um, I nannied for them starting in September of 2012. Were Jennifer and Fotis Dulos married? Yes. When you met them in September of 2012, where were they living? Uh, Fort Jefferson Crossing in Farmington. Where was Mr. Dulos originally from? Greece. Did he speak English? Yeah. Did he speak with an accent? Yeah. Where was Jennifer Dulos originally from? Uh, New York. And you mentioned the Dulos children. How many children did the Dulos family have? Five. And what are the children's names? You have Petros, Theodore, Christian, Constantine, and Noel. And could you give the jury their age ranges currently? Yep. Currently, Petros and Theodore are 17, Krishan and Constantine are 15, and Noel is 13. And you mentioned that Petros and Theodore are 17, and Constantine and uh, Christian are 15. 15. Are they twins? Yeah. So the Dulos has had two sets of twins? Yep, two sets. And when you met them in September of 2012, what was their respective age range? Uh, Noel just turned <coughs> one, I believe. Krishan and Constantine were four, just turned four. And Petros and Theodore were six. How did you get introduced to the Dulos family in 2012? I worked at a daycare center for a few years and someone that I used to also babysit outside of the daycare told me that she knew someone yeah, that needed help. Well, the question is, how did you end up working for the Dulos family? Well, it, this is preliminary, so overruled. You had mentioned that you worked at a daycare center. Would you just continue your answer? Yeah, so someone that worked for Jennifer and Fotis said that she knew of a family that needed extra help and I babysat outside of the daycare. So she introduced myself and my sister. And was your sister also a babysitter? Yeah. What's your sister's name? Ashley. When did you first actually begin babysitting for the Dulos family? So it was September of 2012. I don't know the exact date. How often would you babysit them beginning in September of 2012? It started off just like a Saturday or a Sunday. Like I would usually work Saturday and my sister would usually work Sunday or we would swap. Um, and then over time, I started to work more and more for them. Were you and your sister the only babysitters for the Dulos family? No. You mentioned that you would work a Saturday or a Sunday. What were your typical hours at that point? It varied, um, but usually like early morning, like 6 a.m. sometimes, because no one would wake up early, and I wouldn't leave until like sometimes 9 or 10. 
Were you still attending school when you first began babysitting for the Hewlett family? Yeah, I was in my final year. What types of activities would you do with the children while you were babysitting with them? Uh, we did a lot of puzzles, magnet tiles, and games, board games was a lot. They like to play pretend and dress up. Um, they also water skied, so we would spend a lot of time doing that. Um, and would you actually go water ski with them? Yeah. What did Mr. Dulos do for work when you first met the family? Uh, he owned his construction business. What was the name of the company? Four Group. And you mentioned that it was a construction company. What type of construction? Uh, he was building luxury homes. <coughs> Where was the office for Four Group located? It was in Fort Jefferson Crossing. It was in their, their home. Whereabouts in their home? It was like right above the garage. They had a two bay garage and above that was a space for the office. What did Jennifer do for work when you met the family? I knew she was a writer, but I didn't really know much more than that. Were uh, Mr. Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos ever home while you babysat? Yeah. How often would you say they were home while you were babysitting? Most of the time. How would you describe the dynamic of the Dulos marriage when you met them in 2012? Um, I mean, I tried not to judge, but he was gone a lot, but I just figured that was just kind of what it was in their, their house. But overall, when I first started working for them, they seemed to get along just fine. And how did they act towards one another? Uh, in the beginning. Um, in the beginning, they were nice towards each other. I mean, from what I saw, at least in the beginning. I'm sorry, I missed that? From what I saw, at least in the beginning. And did you continue to babysit for the family for the remainder of your final year of college? Yeah. And for that final year of college, were you just working weekends? Uh, yeah, because I was going to school during the week. I want to direct your attention now to May of 2013. Did your role with the family change at that point? Yeah, so May 2013, I graduated college, and I didn't really have a job um, in place yet, and Jennifer offered me a full-time position with the kids. And what days of the week were you, well, I guess I should ask a preliminary question, which is, did you accept the job? Yes. And at that point, did you become the sole babysitter or nanny for the children? I guess I became like the main one, but there were still some people that would come in, or sometimes there would be two of us, mostly on the weekends, because um, the kids were in school, or they were like at least in preschool, so it's easier with just with one, but. And what days of the week were you working for the family at this point, now that you're a full-time employee? I think it was like Monday through Saturday, so I always worked a weekend day, but it was like half a day, so I wouldn't go in until like maybe like 11 or 12. When you say half a day, you're referring to the weekend day? No, the weekend day was like a full day, from morning to night. So during the week while the kids were in school, I didn't have to show up like as early as I would on the weekend. And what was a typical work day for you as the nanny? Uh, well, the younger ones, just like, you know, helping feed them or helping Jennifer if they had like certain activities that day. Um, which playing with them, keeping them busy, playing outside, giving them baths. Um, I would help with dinner, help with like cleaning up after them. During this time period, did you ever go on vacation with the family? Yes. Where did you go on vacation with the family? All the places. Yes. Uh, so I've gone to St. Bart's with them. I've been to Florida. I've been to Greece a few times. Um, I went to Virginia once with Fotis. We went to Colorado. Did both Jennifer and Mr. Dulos attend these vacations? Um, not all of them. All right. And when you say not all of them, who would not attend? Jennifer. Okay. And did Mr. Dulos ever travel without the children or Jennifer? Yeah. Can you describe the dynamic between Mr. Dulos and his children? Yeah, I mean, when they were younger, they kind of just 
I mean, they listened to whatever their dad said. They didn't get a lot of time with their dad, so their time was mostly on the weekend. And I was with them most of the time on the weekend. So um, they just, they did whatever photos asked them to do. Um, but yeah, that was like the main time that he spent with the kids. How often would Mr. Doulos travel without the family? A lot. Where I don't know the exact days, but enough where it was, you could tell it was a little odd how often he was traveling. Could you describe the dynamic between Jennifer and the children? Yeah, it was very silly, her relationship with the kids. Um, they always wanted to be next to mommy. It was just kind of what it was. And she would sing to them and laugh at them. And she never raised her voice. So he was just like so soft spoken and never got angry. And um, she was just like incredibly nurturing. What types of activities did Jennifer like to do with the children? Oh, she would take them to like, we'd go to the, like these bounce houses all the time um, with Jennifer. But like around the holidays through, you know, getting the Christmas tree was a really big deal and going pumpkin picking and she'd um, draw with them, do puzzles with them. Did Jennifer like to water ski? No. You had mentioned that the children did like to water ski, however, correct? They water skied. Okay. Did, did they not like to water ski? They water skied a lot, um, so I saw times where they didn't want to, but still had to. And as you worked full time for the Dulos family, did you begin to develop a friendship with Jennifer? Yeah. How would you describe your relationship with her? Um, I confided in her with a lot of things, like in my personal life. I just always trusted her. Um, she was someone, she was my boss, but she was someone that, you know, I always just, we just connected really well. We just worked well to, with each other. I knew what she liked, what she didn't. She knew what I was good at. It just, we had a really good relationship. Did you ever meet any of Jennifer's family? Yeah. Who have you met? Um, her mom, Gloria. Her father, Hilly, when he was alive. Um, her sister, Melissa. Um, I've met her cousins. And you would mentioned your father. Has he passed away? Yeah. What year did he pass away? I think it was February of 2018, I think. And is Gloria still alive? Yeah. How old is Gloria? No, I think she's 88 or 89, but I don't want Not to get positive. that wrong. But she's, she's great. Did there come a point in time when Jennifer began confiding in you things about her relationship with the Stulos? Yeah. Jennifer ever expressed to you her feelings on whether Mr. Lewis was paying enough attention to her? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Did Jennifer ever express to you a desire to avoid arguing with Mr. Lewis? Objection, Your Honor. Overruled. Uh, yeah. Did you tell the jury what she said? Uh, she just felt like arguing with Otis, like he was harsh and she didn't like conflict. So she could never really like express how she really felt because it kind of just kind of got looked over. Now, I want to direct your attention to September of 2013. Mm-hmm. Did you begin working at Ford Group? Yeah. Did Mr. Did Mr. Dulos, by the way, did he own Ford Group for the entire time that he babysat and nannied for the family? From what I knew, yeah. How did you come to begin working for Ford Group? Um, so I was working full time for the family from May of 2013 that year. And like I said, I still didn't have like a full time job the nannying was. And so he just asked if I was interested in coming into four group and, you know, having this opportunity. So I just decided to take it. And were you working full time for four group after you took the job? No, it was like half four group and half being a nanny. What type of hours were you working for four group? 
So usually I'd go in at like 8.30, 9 o'clock in four group, and then depending on the kid's schedule, I would have to leave around one or two. I'd maybe basically like cross the door and then I was with the kids until like nine-ish, 9.30. And just to be clear, 9 is 9.30 at night, correct? At night, yeah. Okay. How many days a week were you working for Port Group when you began being employed by Mr. Dulos? Five days, so Monday through Friday. And were you still nannying six days a week? Yeah. Did you have any regular days off? Yeah, usually at that point I was having Sundays off. Um, but if I needed like another day off, it wasn't like with Jennifer, it was kind of easy to do that. But usually, Sundays were my day off at that time. What were your responsibilities before group? Um, in the beginning, it was really just like office work. I was like organizing folders, things like that. I would really like worked alongside Fotis, so I basically would, I would follow him along to work sites, and he would show like um, show me some things because I was totally new to this whole world. Um, and then eventually, in time, I became in charge of the punch list at Four Group, which was um, when a house was built. The owners would have a list of things that they wanted to finish off, like there's a chip here or whatever, and I would be in charge of making sure that that gets done. How did you view Mr. Dulos when you initially began working for Ford Group? Oh, I saw him as like a role model and a mentor, and I thought at the time he's giving me this really great opportunity. So I really, I considered him a friend. And did Mr. Dulos encourage you to go back to school? He did, yeah. What did he encourage you to study? Uh, construction management, but he also was pushing for me to get my real estate license. Was there a telephone number that was associated with Four Group? Yeah, it was Fotis's personal phone number. When you say his personal phone number, are we talking about a landline or a cellular phone? No, like a cellular. And did you often see Mr. Dulos answering work-related calls or sending emails? Yeah. Would it be fair to say that Mr. Dulos kept his cell phone with him at all times during your time working for Four Group? Yeah. When you were working for Four Group, did Jennifer ever express to you what her intentions were with the children? Excuse me, strike that. When you were working for Four Group, did Jennifer ever express to you um, how she wanted you to handle the summers? Uh, yeah. What, what was, did she say? Kind of said that. Did Jennifer ever express to you how she wanted you to handle the children during the summers? Well, the question is, did she express to you how she wanted you to handle the children? Overruled. You can answer. Okay. Um, yeah, I would basically, because the kids wouldn't be in school, so I would be with the kids full time. And how many employees did Ford Group have when you began working for them? Not a lot. It was very small. So like a handful. And when you say handful, can you just be a little bit more specific for the members? Yes, I would. I guess we we'll have to count. <laughs> I would say like five or six, maybe. Was Pavel Gumiani, Gumiani one of the employees? Yep. And what was his role? With, actually, before I ask that. When did he begin working for Four Group, to your knowledge? Oh, to my knowledge, I don't know. He was there when I started, even just babysitting before I ever even worked for Four Group, but I don't know when he started. But okay. And he knew the family for a while, that's all I knew. So by the time you began working for Four Group, he was already working for the, mm -hmm. for the Four Group, is that correct? Yes. And what was his role with the company? <coughs> uh, he was a project manager. He kind of did everything, to be honest. Did Jennifer know Mr. Gumiani as well? Yep. Would he assist her around the house? Yeah. How would he assist her around the house? Uh, he would like, you know, change out the light bulbs when they went out. He would build, He I know he built their, they had this very beautiful playscape in the backyard. I know he built that. He would even sometimes help pick us up from the airport after a trip. Did Jennifer ever work for a Ford group? Not that I know. You had mentioned that Mr. Dulos was a, a role model to you during this time. Mm -hmm. why, why did you consider him to be a role model? Uh, when I first started working, he was 
just incredibly nice. He made me feel comfortable. He was funny. He, you know, I was fresh out of college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And he, it sounded like I was getting this really great opportunity, even though it had nothing to do with any of the work I've ever done. And it seemed like he just wanted to push me and, you know, make me better. And did there come a point in time when the dynamic between Jennifer and Mr. Dulos began to change from when you first met them? Yeah. Could you describe how the dynamic changed for the jury? Uh, the big dynamic change was in March of 2017, which is when Jennifer found out about his affair. And a few months after that, it, it totally changed. So I want to direct your attention now to March of 2017. Did you take a trip with the Dulos family? Yeah. And where did y'all go? Uh, the kids had a two-week break, and so the first week we spent in Aspen, Colorado, and then we flew to Miami for the second week. Who went on the trip? Uh, the first week was myself, five kids, Jennifer Fotis, and his friend Mark Massiello. And then, I think you already mentioned this, but why did the family decide to take a trip in March as opposed to... Oh, the kids, um, their school vacation, they get two weeks off in March. So that's why they get, we went in March. Where were the kids going to school at the time? They were going to Renbrook. It's in Farmington. I'm sorry? It's in Farmington. And when you, where in Colorado did you vacation? It was Aspen. And what types of activities did you and the children do while on the trip? Well, they ski, they're very good snow skiers. So they would ski. Um, Noel, who was younger than everyone else, we kind of would just kind of hang out, walk around the town a little bit. She would ski a little bit. Or whoever was like tired, they would like basically come back with Jennifer and I, and we would do like <clears throat> the hot cocoa stuff. And the other, but they skied a lot. And how old was Noel at this point? Uh, six, maybe. And where did you stay? In Aspen. Uh, Jennifer's father won a house through a charity auction, so we stayed there for a week. And um, did there come a point in time during the trip where Mr. Dulos told the group that he had taken the children to an adult club? Yeah. Who was present for this conversation? Myself and Jennifer. How did Jennifer react upon hearing this? She like was shocked because they were little and they were going to a day club. Um, and so she was like, we were both kind of like disgusted, I guess is the word. And what was Mr. Dulos's demeanor like as he was relaying this information? He was excited that he like paid off the people to let his kids into this day club where, yeah, he seemed really happy about it. And approximately how long did you guys stay in Colorado? It was about a week. And at some point did you travel to Miami? Yep. And I assume you flew? We flew, yeah. And who went to Miami? So myself, the five kids, Jennifer, Fotis, and then Jennifer's mom, Gloria, met us um, in Miami. And where did you stay in Miami initially? Initially, we stayed at the W um, Hotel there. And describe some of your daily activities in Miami. I assume you're not skiing anymore. <laughs> yeah, no snow skiing, but there was water skiing. So okay. they went from snow skiing and they went to Miami to water ski. So really, that was the activity. And where would the, where would the family ski? Uh, it's a Miami Ski Club. And who would go to the ski club? Uh, myself, the kids. Sometimes Noel would stay back with Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer would not go, and Fotis would go. And during this trip, did Jennifer discuss her relationship with Mr. Dulos with you? She did. Objection. Well, at this time, did Jennifer discuss her relationship with Mr. Dulos with you? The answer is either yes or no. Is that a yes? Yes. 
And what did she tell you? Well, what did she tell you about the relationship? I'll rephrase. What did she tell you about the relationship? Objection. Well, that question is very broad. Mm -hmm. I'll call for an answer that could be a narrative. So the court is going to sustain the objection, but not allow, but allow you to pursue the line. You mentioned earlier that Jennifer had found out about the affair. Do you recall testifying to that? Yes. What did Jennifer say to you about the affair when you were in Miami? Objection. Well, that's going to be overruled. Uh, she told me she believed that Fotis was having an affair. And did she say why she believed that? Uh, she just said she had this feeling, he's been acting weird. And I didn't really believe her at first. And when you say you didn't really believe her, what do you mean by that? At that time, I had a good relationship with Fotis, and I believed him to be an honest guy. And I couldn't imagine him having an affair where there's five little kids involved. So what did you say to her? I said no. Ground. But what this witness said is not hearsay. This witness is testifying about what she said, not what another declarant said. It's an out of court statement now. Well, it's an out of court statement, but this witness is the declarant. The witness is telling the jury what she told Jennifer. She has personal knowledge about what she told Jennifer. Overruled. What did you say to Jennifer? I told her I don't think that's true. What was her demeanor like during this conversation? She was very anxious, like kind of tight. Um, and she seemed upset. Was anyone else present for this conversation? Oh, yeah, her mom, Gloria. Now, during this trip, did you meet someone named Michelle Traconis? Yep. Do you see Michelle, Michelle Traconis in the courtroom? Yep. Would you just point her out and tell us what color shirt she has on? Beige. Judge, she identified the defendant. Thank you. The record will reflect. Where did well, you before, before you proceed, you have about two minutes, perhaps. This is an appropriate point at which to conclude today because you're about to go into other matters that are more significant than just identification. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will conclude today's session. I would ask if you not discuss the case, we plan to resume tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Honorable Superior Court now stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10.